It is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Minister Teresa Rivera from Spain to our panel entitled Making Europe Fit for Climate Change. Welcome, Minister Rivera. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind invitation, for having me here with you. Well, it's an honor for us that you join us here. Uh, you have been a driving force uh, of ecological transformation in Europe for quite a while. Uh, you are now the Deputy Prime Minister of Spain and Minister for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge. But uh, you have assumed repeatedly high positions in government before, from 2008 to 2011. You already uh, served as the Spanish Secretary of State uh, for climate change, being responsible already then uh, for environmental and climate policies. And afterwards, you have served as the director uh, of the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations in Paris. And um, you've been one of the key players um, in negotiating the Paris Climate Agreement. And some even consider you to be one of its main architects. So again, thank you for taking the time to discuss with us today where Europe is at in terms of climate policy and energy policy. Um, and, um, but where exactly is Europe at? Uh, let's talk a little bit about one of the hottest issues these days, Brussels taxonomy for sustainable finance. This taxonomy labels nuclear energy and gas as sustainable, as green, and Spain, you, you have left no doubts about your positions. Uh, when the commission published uh, its draft on New Year's Eve, uh, you voiced, quote, grave concerns. And you said, well, this is a step backwards. Maybe you might elaborate. Why do you think this taxonomy sends the wrong signals? Isn't this just an expression of pragmatic politics? In Germany, we say realpolitik. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the question. I think that, uh, as you say, it is a tricky issue, but it uh, misleads uh, anyone trying to identify which are the non-risk uh, technologies where any neutral investor could invest their money, uh, thinking that it is sustainable, climate compatible, and easy to, to decarbonize in a fast way our economy. Uh, the taxonomy doesn't intend to uh, uh, forbid any type of investments in any field, but it tries to, to figure out, uh, to find a quick level that uh, people can understand in a very easy manner. And this is what uh, we lose when we uh, uh, mix a little bit of everything, including those technologies that do have significant impacts, so how to deal with nuclear waste, or which are um, very pitifully, but uh, are fossil fuel based, so uh, intense in CO2 emissions. And I think that, uh, as I say, we all can understand that we may need some technologies in the transitional times, and we may need some backup and so on and so on, but it should not be uh, classified as equal to green hydrogen or to renewable energy or investment in efficiency or other innovations that we are trying to promote. And this is why I think that uh, it risks uh, different countries uh, accepting different taxonomies and coming back to gold standards being proposed by a task force that made a great effort to identify which were the best uh, bets uh, to support. Let me just follow up on the golden standard. You suggested that uh, given your criticism, um, Spain might introduce its own sort of taxonomy to issue green bonds. Um, and this would be the golden standard while uh, the European taxonomy would be the silver standard. I'm wondering, I mean, if we talk that much about Europe and Europe's, Europe's strength and Europe only delivers silver standard, uh, what's Europe's climate policy worth if its standards are second best? This is a very important question, and I think that this is the main challenge. Uh, I think that it could be much more fair to say, I keep uh, the gold standard for Europe, of course, understanding that there may be additional investments coming from different member states because of 
a wide range of uh, reasons. I, it's not that I'm supporting one thing or another, but I can understand that sometimes we need some pragmatism, as you say. My big question is to what extent this uh, pragmatism can uh, show that we could be accepting uh, long-term investments in the long run, because uh, the idea is to accept whatever it comes uh, before 2045. So in a very short period of, uh, of uh, time before, we are supposed to be fully decarbonized. Uh, mm. And uh, we try to label that as green. That, that doesn't make sense. Um, so I would prefer having a green gold standard and then accepting that there are other possibilities that people will be uh, seeking finance for in the capital markets. But this way, uh, as, um, as the European Commission is uh, pushing forward, I guess that we will have a silver standard, but there will be many member states and many companies that would try to say that they do not include these technologies in their own portfolio. So I think that uh, it is uh, almost unavoidable that we will have better standards. Europe should be leading this discussion at the international level. This example can uh, help others to use similar references to those technologies that we do not consider compatible with this uh, fast, uh, um, fast decarbonization and, and clear sign as to investors. Mm -hmm. If Europe would develop a gold standard for everything, this would probably uh, be the best solution. I mean, of course, you're not alone with your criticism. Uh, Austria and Luxembourg uh, have announced that they would take the taxonomy, if it stays this way, uh, uh, to court. Do you see any real chance still to change uh, the, the shape and the substance of the, subs of, of the taxonomy in the, in, in the next month? I mean, there a supermajority is needed. Is there viewed pragmatically a real chance to still alter this provision? As far as I know, and of course, I don't know how, in a detailed manner how things are going on in Brussels, but as far as I know, a, um, the understanding of pragmatism for the time being is finding midway. A, uh, this means that um, under its capacity to adopt uh, delegated acts, the commission uh, could be um, getting a, a strong position that should be challenged by a great majority in the council. Uh, and it is not so easy to have this, uh, this, uh, this majority against this proposal from the commission because of different reasons. So uh, um, it may be possible that the delegated act uh, could be finally adopted. The question is to what extent some member states, as announced by Austria and Luxembourg, may challenge this um, delegated act for both formal and substantial reasons. To what extent the Commission can go beyond what it was in the original uh, decision being taken by the Council, or uh, to what extent there could be other means to ensure that participation, transparency, and visibility should be should have been taken into account. So that can be a, uh, also, a, uh, I could say, a source of a, uh, complexity, a, so a source of uncertainty for uh, investors, which is not, of course, a good thing either to happen. We have been working hard to have uh, this uh, clear, bold messages being accompanied with pragmatism in the margins. And um, instead of that, what we find is a little bit of mess in the central uh, uh, circus and uh, um, marginal movements uh, trying to, to identify uh, best options uh, among the possible ones. Mm -hmm. let's, let's switch to another issue that has um, been important for European citizens and consumers uh, probably most important recently, Europe's energy crisis. Um, Sky-high gas and electricity prices have hit Europe hard and Spain even harder. You yourself said Spain was in the eye of the hurricane, which is a pretty strong description. Uh, why has Spain been hit so hard by the energy crisis? Well, um, probably because we experience uh, since the very first moment the impact of uh, natural gas prices in the electricity prices because of the design of the electricity market and because of the existence 
of um, a tariff uh, which is uh, used by 40% of the population that it is uh, fully aligned with the with the uh, pool prices with the with the with the uh, big uh, market uh, electricity market prices uh, so the impact was very very direct uh, for citizens and it is direct also for companies who were relying on the uh, incoming lower prices thanks to the high penetration of renewable energy with a very low operational cost. The, um, the, to me, the main political issue with um, very deep economic implications is that um, we Europeans uh, have a problem. We had already a problem because of the price of natural gas. And we are accepting by the lack of uh, movement uh, that this impacts uh, in a very important manner the electricity prices. So uh, this, these electricity prices that are due to the way we have designed uh, the functioning of the market, which is good for many reasons, but probably has its own limits, is under a, a pressure that we had never known before. The difference between uh, the cost of one technology and the rest of the technologies is so huge that we are not only paying the extra cost of that part of the electricity being generated by gas. Mm. We are accepting that all the other technologies are getting the same remuneration, which is different. Um, and it is posing a great challenge, a great macroeconomic challenge, because uh, it, has, uh, it is driving a, uh, inflation, but, uh, but also in terms of how much money we are uh, um, draining from the economy in Europe that should be uh, being invested in uh, social measures, so to facilitate the, the energy transition, in more uh, investments in energy transformation, so to accelerate the energy transition, or in innovation, so to be ready for, for the technologies to come. And instead of that, we are accepting that that uh, difference, that, uh, that difference in terms of uh, the amount of money we are paying for something that does not equal the real cost, goes to wherever. Maybe to the gas providers, so not always a good news. Uh, to the financial markets who are getting profits from these movements or from energy companies that can be investing or not in the acceleration of the energy transition. So every single citizen, every single industry will at the end be uh, feeling the difference and the, the race of, uh, of cost of the electricity because uh, normally uh, from time to time, even if we have uh, signed it in long-term uh, tariffs, in, in long-term sustainable cost of electricity, this, uh, this price is, is reviewed and updated. And um, there are three things that uh, are not true anymore. Uh, the first message we got is no panic. This is going to last a short period of time and it is already a year and we don't know how long it can last. The second thing is no worries. The market will be using this money to accelerate the energy transition, something that has not been proven. And third a thing which is um, even worse is that um, it uh, increases the inequalities among citizens because the answer from the commission is if you are ready to cover with your budget, go ahead, but mm. do not distort the market. And the budgets just... and the fiscal capacity are not the same among the different member states. So we may be risking also to, to, to have some additional uh, mistreats coming from citizens and uh, social support uh, coming from the different societies to this move. Let me just jump in with the uh, social inequality you just mentioned and the social impact of electricity prices. Spain has, if I've read it correctly, had a steep increase in energy poverty in, in, in recent years, meaning more and more people were unable to pay their energy bills due to high uh, energy prices. You have fought for social measures countering this development. And from early on, you've said, well, please, Europe, let's do it together, jointly. Um, instead, and I prefer a, a European approach over national solutions. Yet the EU only offered a so-called toolbox. Um, each member state could pick and choose or not do anything. Isn't that a rather weak signal uh, Europe has been sending in the crisis so far? 
we, we don't like this answer because uh, we are very pro-Europeans and we think that um, uh, Europe has, uh, has made a great effort to provide a common policy on energy, both domestically and in terms of uh, the external implications of energy policies. And I think that this, um, this, uh, this is a little bit at risk because um, what we are answering is instead of being paid by consumers, pay the difference by uh, taxpayers, which is not the same because the difference goes to somewhere, as I said. And this somewhere is a market that uh, could work on an expectation of profits, an expectation of stability, but of course could not expect this great impact in terms of uh, instability or in terms of additional uh, increases in, in the cost, the difference between cost and prices. So I think that we should be uh, um, uh, thinking, assessing what is the threshold of what we can accept and what is the threshold beyond uh, uh, which we should be thinking on uh, temporary exceptional measures. Our proposal is that we should be working in two different fields. One field is um, to open the discussion on how to evolve, to make the evolution between the current design of the market that was featured in 1996 and onwards towards something which is very different. It's not just big players. There are many different players, the grids, the, 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 um, the digitalization, the, the, the new technologies, the storage, they come to, to stay. So how, how this market should be evolving. And this takes a long time. A period of time. So it is good to have a broad discussion, not to take measures from one day to the next one, but to open this discussion that should be taking place in five years' time, but that probably needs to be anticipated. And at the same time, we are proposing and insisting on adopting exceptional temporary measures. Our preferred one, knowing that um, there is no a perfect response, should be to keep the, um, the, uh, the market as it stands without that technology that disturbs uh, the system, which is natural gas. So paying mm -hmm. the natural gas at its cost, higher cost, and uh, allow the market to function without the natural gas for a while. As I say, um, during the time that, uh, that this uh, tension is uh, still there. Um, I think that uh, this is the idea we are proposing. Uh, we could be very happy to have ideas coming from other member states, from the Commission, from Acer. We think that it is worth it to think about uh, how we can respond to this challenge. What, to our mind, it is not acceptable is to say, sorry, the market is um, something that cannot be touched. So um, we are very sorry for our citizens, our industries, but uh, we are not going to touch. I think that this, this could be feeding a, a much more deeper crisis in terms of uh, the confidence on Europe in a moment that Europe has responded in a very fantastic manner to, to the challenges we have been facing with the COVID and so on and so on. So I think that we should be using this opportunity to build more Europe instead of uh, weakening its, um, its credibility towards the citizens and the industry. The Germans have been resistant to, to market uh, changes in the market design, as far as I uh, gather, at least the last government. Let me just uh, focus on one point you said, because the Commission uh, has stated repeatedly, if the Green Deal uh, does not ensure a just, a fair and inclusive transition, um, they always said we may leave no one behind, uh, then there will be no Green Deal. Franz Timmermans had repeat, has repeatedly said that um, this means Europe needs to provide for social measures uh, to ease burdens like uh, high energy prices. In your view, has the transition in Europe been just and fair and inclusive so far? This is a complicated question. We have tried to, to do it as just and as fair as uh, we could figure out uh, in Spain. And I have to say that um, I have to thank the neighbors, the uh, unions, and even the companies that were behind uh, um, the coal plants and the coal mines. In three years' time, um, we have phased out 90% of our coal capacity, and it has been a huge 
effort. Um, and the participation of the local players has been key. So the position of the government was, we are going to help to create the opportunities and to fund in a way that it is compatible with the European law, but mm -hmm. it is your participation and it is the way you identify where there are uh, the additional possibilities where you want to feed, to feed in. And it, it has been working to the point that we have uh, made a public call in some of these uh, places, uh, so to, to be sure that we could, could use social, economic, and environmental criteria to identify which could be the winners to, to, to have access to the grid or to have access to, to some of this um, public uh, additional funding. And the, and the projects that have been presented are extraordinary. So when you shape and define a, um, the rules of the game in a different manner, people respond. Corporates, citizens, local, uh, local players, and of course, local authorities. And I think that it is fantastic. Um, in this point in time at the European level, I think that this is a very critical uh, situation. And I think that Franz Timmermans is absolutely right. Um, either it is just, and it is perceived as just as fair, or it will not happen. And this is my main concern when talking about uh, the price of um, energy in Europe, because people can think that this is something good to make money for the big companies, but it is me who pays. And, and this is very bad news. We need people experiencing the, the, the public effects, the, the, the positive impacts of um, uh, the energy transition. So all these programs about uh, solar rooftops, small uh, scale uh, um, energy solutions, uh, final cost of the energy, fiscal treatment of the different movements. I think skilling and reskilling workers, I think it is absolutely key. And for now, what we are seeing is that there is a distortion that is directly associated to the way we regulators have shaped the market, which is crazy how people cannot understand why we support this failure, which is a failure of design being made by the regulators. So I think that it is critical to, to lower, to attenuate, to mitigate this, this terrible impact in, term of, uh, in terms of uh, cost for the, for the society. How big do you consider the risk that uh, this energy crisis you, you've mentioned and described now, in fact, undermines public support for the Green Deal? I'm so convinced that the right answer is Green Deal and green transition and energy transition that I think that it is very important to insist once and again to show and to allow people to experience that it is true. So it is not that we say, it is that it is true. Um, but it is also true that there may be some, some groups or some people willing to undermine the credibility of uh, the energy transition uh, or the Green Deal, saying that it is because um, we are insisting on something that it is very expensive and very um, uh, lack of uh, social justice. So I think that um, uh, it is always important to, to take uh, the social consideration uh, into account when uh, defining any type of response. Otherwise, uh, um, the fear to the change uh, will, uh, will create a much more difficult uh, situation, a much more difficult context to advance. And in that, in that point, uh, it is where I wonder to what extent uh, the corporates, the investors should be a little bit more audacious and brave because that also impacts in their own credibility and in their own acceptance by the society. And um, it is true that we talk about uh, the ESG principles and so on and so on. I think that it is a good moment to demonstrate to what extent they also can be innovators when using these references in a difficult context, in a difficult challenge. And so uh, for the time being, I'm not hearing much about that. <laughs> so a call to the corporate world to be more brave in terms of the uh, Green Deal. I, I, was one, I was wondering, energy policy is, as you know best, always geopolitics as well. Um, Russia has now demonstrated that it is willing to use uh, energy as a political tool, some even say as blackmail, uh, to, to blackmail Europe. Who, in your view, will be Europe's new friends, uh, the new energy providers, the new suppliers? 
Well, I think that we will be living with natural gas for a while yet. And I think that the, um, the, uh, the, the diversification of, of the providers is key and to work with the providers is also key because we, we have been uh, developing, I mean, the Western world has been developing a particular relation as big consumers with the oil uh, providers for, for decades. But this is new now for, for a very long time it was the same and now it is not the same anymore it's a little bit different and i think that uh, um, it is true that we need to pay attention on these relationships at the same time we know that uh, this is going to last still some decades but it is the transition towards something different and the preparedness for this new something different is also important. So it is very interesting to see how IRENA or the International Energy Agency or the OECD or others um, look into this new uh, geopolitical relation. So which are the rare materials, thinking about sustainable mining and sustainable raw materials is key. We have much more in Europe than what we could think, but at the same time, it is something that we do not want to look at or that we fear to look at accepting without looking into the effects that um, that uh, the extraction of these raw materials uh, can have in third countries. So I think that the, the, the discussion changed a little bit. And the other thing which is very important to me is to avoid new dependencies. So we cannot change um, the dependency from oil and gas towards a dependency on technological innovations or raw materials. This is something that we have also learned along this um, strange two last years, no? the, this crisis about the microchips uh, or this crisis about uh, the, uh, the maritime transport and the image of this big cargo uh, blocking the, the Suez Channel. I think that, that, uh, that um, there are many new question marks or at least the, um, the, uh, the focus on the traditional discussion on globalization changes a little bit. So how to combine the local and the global uh, questions and the um, different interdependencies in a much more sane and healthier manner, not just the big picture, but also what, what it represents in the distributional effects of these changes. And it has geopolitical implications, of course. Mm -hmm. This conference is called Europe 2022. Um, so I was wondering what's, I mean, you're very forceful with your statements and willing uh, to go ahead with your position. What's your agenda for 2022 for Europe? What is what is it Europe needs to accomplish this year to be fit enough to uh, fight climate change? I think that we should be a, um, a reaching a broad consensus on the on the main references into in the Fit for 55 package. There are still uh, um, many big discussions, uh, primary uh, design discussions uh, on the table. And at the same time, I think uh, Europe should be uh, investing in, um, in our external agenda. I think that uh, sometimes we, we tend to, to, to work in, in the micro uh, details of our domestic agenda, and we do, not attention to, we do not pay attention to the big things that we have to offer and to discuss, to invest in our own geopolitical or bilateral agenda with, with third countries. So to co-build and to co-invest uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, my sense is that uh, we have a great chance to do so along the year because um, it is pretty demanded in many different countries of the world. So the story of um, how weak we may be by relation to others and how the others also rely on us uh, to, to invest is important. Um, we are seeing that uh, Biden has um, a great agenda, which is not always easy to, to, to move forward. We are seeing what happens if um, a, uh, we depend very much on, 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 some, on some parties, some partners that are not always reliable. Uh, so building in, in a multipolar world, uh, um, these uh, this positive and constructive relations is also, is also very important. Well, Minister Rivera, we're at the end of our session, uh, unfortunately. 
thank you very, very much for being with us and uh, sharing your thoughts and your views and positions. Uh, I'm pretty sure the issues discussed will remain on the agenda and we will be curious to see how you will follow up this year in 2022 uh, on your agenda, how Spain will push ahead. Thank you very much for taking the time and uh, greetings to Madrid and best wishes. Thank you. Thank you so much to you all. And I hope you have a great uh, conference, a great session. Thank you very much.